Hello and welcome back. In this video we're going to talk a bit about probability, some of the problems and deceptions of probability. Mark Twain once said that there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Probability is based on statistics, so once we start getting into probabilities we should be aware that we're getting into some troubled waters. It's not to say that we should discount probability altogether, however we need to know its limitations and its liabilities if we're going to put any uh, credence into it and before we start putting our money at risk solely based on probability we, we need to know what those limitations are so let's take a look okay the deception of probability one standard deviation ten days out is much more likely to be violated than a one standard deviation forty days out and basically what this is saying is that the theory of probability says that one standard deviation probability of something happening in one standard deviation should always be the same regardless of the time frame. However, that's not really true in real life and it's not really something that common sense would tell you that it's true. So let's take a little bit closer look at what I'm talking about here and it might become a little bit clearer. Okay, so this is a picture of option view and we can see that we have these options in July. I'll go ahead and mark them up here. We have these options in July that are 10 days out. And we have these options here that are in August and uh, that's 38 days out. So the one standard deviation move, if this is at the money in July, the one standard deviation move is represented right here where this pink shaded area ends. And in the puts, it's down here where the pink shaded area ends here with at the money being right there. Out in August, the one standard deviation move is up in this area here, a little bit further out. So let's take a, a different look at this. So this is a chart, a bar chart, with the standard deviation areas highlighted on the chart. So let's mark the areas up here. So you can see that there's a bar here, right here, and the close of that bar is right here. So the close at the moment is right in this area and the X1 down here is our 30 day option and the X2 is our, or excuse me, the X1 is a 10 day option and the X2 is the 38 day option. So what this graph is showing us, the green area is our profit zone for each of these two trades. The first X1 area ends right here. So we can see that the X1 area from the close to here isn't very far. In fact, in this case, it's almost the same length as the bar of a one-day move. So theoretically, based on that, a one-day move, we could hit the one standard deviation area, in this case for the puts, down in this area right here very easily. It's just almost a similar distance up to the, the one standard deviation on the upside. Now, we know the market tends to go back and forth like this very rarely does it make a move like this. It just happened to have made one recently, but if we look back across the pattern of the chart, it doesn't usually do that a lot. So the chances of it going all the way out here to the one standard deviation at the 38 day option or down to here, it would take essentially a very sustained unidirectional move up to this area in a, a relatively short period of time for that kind of a move. So you can see that just the normal market movement would possibly get us out of these two loss points, whereas it takes a much more sustained move in the market to reach these points. Now, the market itself doesn't really know anything about probability or statistics. It's just doing what it does. And in a short, the point here is that in a shorter period of time, it's much more likely that the market would hit a one standard deviation point than it is uh, during a longer period of time. And this is one of the things that can be deceiving about probability is if you try to uh, use it in all situations. You need to understand the market has its own mind and getting a sustained move you know, up into these areas over here is much more difficult for the market to do than it is in a shorter, the shorter distances in the shorter time frame. The Iron Condor Conspiracy. It sounds like a, a good movie, but uh, in this case what I want to focus on is that 
An iron condor with a 70% probability of expiring at profit uh, also has roughly a 70% probability of breaching one of the short strikes. Now a lot of people who are trading iron condors, high probability iron condors, they put them on and they assume or hope that they'll just wake up at the end of the month and they'll end up in a profit. Now the 70% probability is a statistic and it's borne out over many iterations. In other words, if we did this particular trade a thousand times, most likely the statistics would be bared out. In other words, 70% 70 70 of the time we would end up in the profit zone. However, we're not going to do this trade a thousand times. We're probably only going to do it once. The next trade is going to be a unique instance, uh, maybe similar, but over time, because we're moving things around, we may not really get close to that 70%. The other thing is that the second half of the sentence says that there's a 70% probability of breaching one of the short strikes. Well, when we breach one of the short strikes, almost all iron condor strategists that I know of start looking at adjusting the trade. When you start adjusting the trade, you're changing the original probability. Once we start adjusting, we can't assume we're going to keep that original probability. The other thing I hear a lot from people is that they put on a 70% probability iron condor, they wake up the next morning, the market's moved a little bit, not hitting one of their short strikes or anything, but they look at it and it shows them there's, there's only a 50% probability. And, you know, that's not what I signed up for. But that's what happens. As the market moves, the probabilities change. And a lot of these trades are thought of as market neutral. However, they're very dependent on direction. Right, so let's look at this 70% probability trade. So here's a risk graph of our 70% probability iron condor. You can see that down here. It's actually 67% probability. It's not really a bad looking trade. We're risking $1,200 to make somewhere on the order of, you know, $840. However, our, our short strikes are right here. So what I'm saying is on the 70% trade, there's a 70% chance that the market will move this direction enough to hit that strike or move this direction enough to hit that strike. And I'll, uh, show you that with a probability calculator in just a minute. However, if that's the case, and remember this is the zero line here, right from the get-go, if this market starts moving one, one direction or another, and in fact if it moves on the, on the upside, we start moving, uh, start losing money right away. So by the time it gets to our short strike, especially on this side, we're starting to panic a little bit and we're going to want to adjust this trade which once you do an adjustment it skews the probabilities completely so people sit back and think oh 70 percent that's a good probability but there's a 70 percent chance that you're going to need to manage this trade at some point so uh, don't think of it as a market neutral trade that you can just leave on and wake up later you're probably going to have to manage it which changes probabilities which kind of undermines your whole premise for putting the trade on to begin with Obviously, our strategy tries to mitigate that situation. Now, here's the probability calculator and option view. And if we take a look here, this is our, our lower short strike, and this is our upper short strike. We can see down here the, the probability of ever touching the lowest target is 40.5%. Probability of ever touching the highest target is 35.8%. So we end up with something on the order of a 75% or 76% chance that one of our two strikes is going to get hit, which a lot of people put on iron condors thinking that most of the time they won't have to adjust the trade, which just isn't true. Uh, that's if they have an adjustment strategy at all. So let's make a deal. You might remember a, a game show by Monty Hall where it was called Let's Make a Deal. And what Monty Hall would do, if we can switch over to uh, our browser, we'll take a look. What Monty Hall would do would be to offer one of the contestants uh, three doors to choose from. The contestant would choose one of the three doors. And then what Monty Hall would do, instead of opening that door, he'd open one of the other two doors that they didn't choose. And a lot of times there was either, there was usually some kind of, you know, bogus prize behind the door that he opened, that left two doors remaining and Monty would always ask the contestant if they want to switch their bet to the other door, the other unopened door. At that point, your mind kind of says, 
there's a 50-50 chance, because there's only two doors left, it's a 50-50 chance, I stay, because there's only a 50-50 chance. There's no advantage necessarily to switching to the other door. That's intuitively what people thought, and people did most of the time stay with their original choice. However, uh, there's kind of a, a rule of statistics going on at, at play here in this particular scenario, and we'll take a look at it. We're going to run through two scenarios. We're going to run it ten times this game. We're going to do ten times one way, and then we're going to do ten times the other way. The first way we're going to do it is we're going to choose our original door. I'll go ahead and do it. Monty reveals some other door, and then we stay with our original door by clicking on it. So in this case, we lost. We'll do it again. I'll pick a start with a different door. And we'll stay this time with our original door, and we lost again. We'll do it again. Uh, the third time, I'll pick this door, and I'll stay with our original door. This time we won. I'll start over at one. Uh, we'll stay with our door. We lost. I'll try it again. I'll stay with our door. We lost. I'll try it again. Stay with our door. We lost. I'll try it again. Stay with our door. We lost. I'll try it again. Stay with our door. We won. Do it again stay with our door, we won, try it again, we'll stay, and we lost again. So we can see that by staying with the original door, we played 10 times, and we won only 3 out of 10 times. So let's do it again this time, and this time what we're going to do is we're going to always switch our bet when Monty gives us the uh, choice. So we'll start with door number 1, we'll switch our choice, we lost. Let's do it again, we'll start, We'll switch our choice, we won. We'll do it again. We'll switch our choice, we won. We'll do it again. We'll switch our choice, we won. We'll do it again. We'll switch our choice, we won. Do it again. We'll switch our choice, we won. We'll do it again. We'll switch our choice, we lost. Do it again. We'll switch our choice, we won. Do it again. We'll switch our choice. We won. We'll do it again. And this time we'll switch our choice. That's the last one. And we won. So you can see that by staying on the door that we originally chose, we only won 3 out of 10 times. When we were willing to switch our bet, we won 8 out of 10 times. So I've done this game, you know, many, many times now, and the outcome is always the same. When you switch your choice, you win a lot more. So let's take a look at why that might be the case. So I'll just read this. This answer goes against our intuition that with two unopened doors left, the odds are just 50-50 that the car is behind one of them. But when you stick with door number one, you'll win only if your original choice was correct, which happens only one in three times on average. If you switch, You'll win whenever your original choice was wrong, which happens two out of three times. Our brains are not wired to understand this probability correctly. In other words, in the markets, we're easily deceived. The big takeaway point from this is usually our original choice is wrong. And that's something that, that we need to deal with. The conditions that we enter in in the market don't have this finite timeline like the Monty Hall game has. The inner relationships between the choices we're making and the timelines that we're using are a lot different and a lot more complex. However, almost always we're wrong. So that's the big takeaway here. And that's the reason that a lot of directional traders who are trading on intuition lose most of the time. All right, coming up next, uh, we'll take a look at some traditional options trades and some of the liabilities of those trades and that'll set us up for understanding why our strategy is unique and better and takes care of a lot of those problems.